I stumble again I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond the fame In my heart, in my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out You will above all else My purpose remains The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame in my heart in my soul i give you control consume me from the inside Justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart Is to bring you praise from Stumble again. I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all things. In my heart, in my soul, I give you control. Consume. Justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart Is to bring you praise from Chains are gone I've 
not Pastor Rob. He is coming home tomorrow though, so he's in transit. So if you guys could pray for him with traveling blessings, I'm sure he will appreciate trying to get home on time. He he understands that sometimes there's different delays with traveling, but he's ready for bed. <laughs> yes. yes. So uh, before we have our guest speaker, uh, is there any prayer requests? I know that you uh, mentioned something about your your teeth. Oh. Uh, to 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 pray for for healing. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, is there anyone else that had a prayer request? Tom. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So for for you, and then you said the Tom. Uh, just health stuff or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Family, I 
That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Work situations. Uh, anyone else? Okay, so we'll go ahead and do a quick prayer over those things, and then I will introduce you up. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to gather today. Um, though we miss our Pastor Rob, we are so thankful that he gets to come home. Please, please, please bless him with all your traveling mercies, because I know that he would probably like to get back to Missouri. Um, thank you that they are they had a safe time there. Uh, we kept tabs on them. Thank you for that. Thank you that they got to reach out to many, many, many people. And we'll hear that story when he comes back. Um, Lord, we also lift up some some healing, um, having some some teeth issues here, but knowing that teeth pains, they, it hurts. Um, so we pray for healing and a quick recovery with that. Um, Lord, we lift up the different family units at our church. Um, things just kind of going on, and I pray for your mercies and um, your influence, whatever they may be. Um, we also pray for work issues because we know they are plenty. Um, we pray for your patience, your peace, your kindness, um, and we pray for your understanding for things that we do not yet know, but your patience and knowing that you will work things out. In your, Lord, uh, in your name, Lord, we give you praise and glory. And please bless our speaker and let and please speak with, through her to give us a wonderful message. In your name, amen. All right, so if you'd like to come up and introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, good morning. I am excited to be with you guys um, this morning in the Word and in worship. Uh, my name is Briley Eilers. I currently serve um, as a campus missionary with Chi Alpha at the University of Missouri um, in Columbia. We serve with many different, there, we serve on all three campuses there um, uh, with Chi Alpha. Um, and if you, I think Blaze and Julie have been here before, so you might have heard. Um, so yeah, Chi Alpha, we're a campus ministry on 300 different campuses across the country. Um, and our whole purpose is to engage, teach, and equip college students to become transformed disciples of Christ. Um, we are sponsored by the Assemblies of God and we receive a support and encouragement and just like connectivity to people who are not just college students um, through the Assemblies of God. So it's great to be here with you guys this morning. Um, and each Chi Alpha looks a little bit different. It has its own little personality, but um, at Mizzou, it looks like weekly worship services, weekly Bible studies for guys and girls, and then um, monthly events like we just went roller skating in Jefferson City um, and hangouts to build community. Um, I got involved with Chi Alpha my freshman year as a journalism student. I served as a student leader for three years. And then my senior year, the Lord started calling me um, to give back, to serve college students the way that I had been served during my four years at Mizzou. And after two years in our Give Year program, which is kind of like, it's like an internship, um, I stepped onto staff this past fall and serve as our connections team leader and um, serve a, a leading a Bible study as well. Um, Chi Alpha is more than just what we do, though. It's um, a place where God changes and transforms people's stories. Like, for example, Sherelle. Um, no, she, there's this picture of all of us there from our fall retreat, but Sherelle was a freshman my senior year, and I've gotten to chain uh, to watch, see her uh, disciple, and live on her through her four years at Mizzou. I've seen her grow from a timid person who wasn't really even sure if she wanted to follow Jesus to someone who is a bold um, and bold proclaimer of the gospel. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Sherelle stood in front of her friends, some family, and professors and students at a senior English capstone project. And for part of her project, she shared her testimony. Um, so watched her go from being very timid and not sure if she wanted to follow Jesus to telling students, secular students at a secular university that Jesus is changing her life. Um, so that was really awesome to watch. And then there's students like Andrew who came to Mizzou um, after serving four years in the army. And he came looking to like live the typical college party lifestyle that happens at Mizzou. Um, but he met... He met one of our student leaders and became like, they're like as thick as thieves. They're best friends. Um, and for a few years, 
Andrew struggled with following God because he wanted to follow God, but he also wanted that party lifestyle that was available at Mizzou, um, but started to lay that down. And within this last year, he's laid all those things down. He fasted and prayed for 40 days just to like see God move in his life and to see him change things. Um, and he's now serving as a student leader. So this one of our student leaders poured into him so well, the Lord changed and transformed him. He's now getting to do that same thing. Um, so these are just like two of the many, many, many stories that I have of students being changed and transformed day in and day out. Um, the college campus is one of the most strategic mission fields in the world because unlike anywhere else, you have every age, race, gender, um, cultural background, religion, language represented all at one time in one place that we can access. And from our campus, students go out to across the world to impact it one way or another. Um, so we want to engage, teach, and equip college students to become transformed disciples of Christ so that they can change the world for the kingdom of God. Um, that's like really briefly me and my story and like what Chi Alpha is. I know you guys have heard of that before. Um, if you have any more questions, if you want to hear more about my story, there's a lot to it. A lot of ways that Jesus is working and changing and transforming me even still. Um, so if you would like to hear more, please feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, I love sharing about what God is doing in me and what he's doing through our campus ministry. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pray for us before we dive into the word um, and then we'll get started. Jesus, I thank you so much for the opportunity to know your word, Lord, that, that you have given us access to know um, the things that you say, to know how you act, to know um, your purposes for us through the word and through um, the word that you've given us, Lord. So I pray today that um, you would bless the words that I say, that it would resonate with people's hearts, Lord, that the things that you need each person to hear, that they would take that away from this time, that they would have ears to hear, not what I'm saying, but what you're saying to them today, Lord Jesus. Um, bless our time together. Um, open our eyes to the beauty of your word and the treasure that is found in it. And it's in your name I pray all of these things. Amen. So if there's one thing that I've learned doing ministry for the last couple of years is that you don't actually know what you're doing in ministry. <laughs> um, it sounds funny, but a lot of times it's way more true than I would like to admit. Not only are there the struggles, weaknesses, and heartbreaks of the students that I'm leading, but sometimes the things I know littlest about is what Jesus is working on in my own life. These last few years have felt full of plan altering, decision requiring, anxiety inducing moments. And it felt like each time something new would pop up and I would be asked to make decisions without having the knowledge, capacity or strength to make them. And I think I think more so than any time in these last couple of years, we can all relate to the fact that there's a lot of junk in our lives. Um, in some cases and in some senses these past few years, I've known what to do and what the right decisions to make are, but there have been many more cases where I have needed someone else or someone better to show me how to live life in a world that is weighty and full of brokenness. And if I had to guess, most of you in this room have needed that at some point within these last three years as well. That's why this morning I want to share with you about God's promised guidance. Guidance is defined as the act or function of guiding, which is to assist a person to travel through or reach a destination in an unfamiliar area as by accompanying or giving directions to that person. That's what I have been in need of, some assistance traveling through this life and all the unfamiliar circumstances I've come across. And as I've turned to God and his word again and again, he assures that he will, he is, and he has been guiding me. One of the most well-known affirmations and assurances of this promise is found in Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I won't be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23 was written by David, Israel's second king and an ancestor of the ultimate king and Messiah, Jesus. David is a man revered by a lot of people because the Bible describes him as being a man after God's own heart. 
this suggests and the word shows that David didn't just know God like a passing acquaintance or a friend of a friend. He had an intimate relationship with the God of the universe who had seen him through a battle with a giant, a jealous king who wanted to kill him, and his own failures on the throne. David had plan, and plan requiring, decision requiring, anxiety inducing, heartbreaking moments throughout his life, and he knew how to seek and find God's guidance. David knows about guidance, but he knows about it intimately because David was a shepherd himself. Before David was ever anointed king by Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, he tended his father's flocks as a shepherd. If anyone can identify a shepherd, if anyone knows what the office of a shepherd looks like, it's probably another shepherd. And if anyone knows what a sheep looks like, acts like, and thinks like, it's a shepherd. Most scholars believe that this psalm was written during David's kingship, possibly later in his reign. I think that's significant because David could have called on the Lord as a king or spoke the difficulties of ruling, but in comfort, David recalled God as the ultimate and divine shepherd. David has an understanding here of who he is and who God is, based on deeply personal knowledge and experience, gui gui guiding and leading sheep, and being guided and led by God. It's an understanding that we should grasp from this psalm as well. We need a shepherd, and God has proven himself as a good one. Our only worthy response to that fact is to follow him. At the time of writing this psalm, David is the most powerful man in the country and is probably one of the most powerful kings in the region at the time. Men fear and revere him as a warrior and leader, and yet what I see here is that David understands one undeniable fact about himself. He is a sheep. This isn't just because David called the Lord his shepherd in the first verse of Psalm 23. The word makes pretty clear that we as humans are very comparable to these dumb, skittish, and very dependent animals. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a pretty strong indictment against us as people, and we are not exempt from the prophecy of Isaiah. Each of us, at some point, has chosen to go off of God's path and follow our own. Um, if I'm being honest, I usually choose my own path multiple times an hour, let alone in a day or a lifetime. Um, and whether I choose to do this one time or a hundred times, I have been the very same sheep Isaiah has talked about. I need a shepherd to not just get me back on the right path, but to show me what the right path even is. And as people who know the price paid for us on the cross, the consequences of us following our own paths should weigh on us. Straying away from God's path may seem like a small thing to us, but God, but in God's eyes, it was so against his plan, so outside of what was meant for us as sheep, that it required our death. And if it didn't, then God would not have sacrificed his son so that we didn't have to die. Anytime we may think that it's a small thing to follow our own paths, we need to look back to the cross. Our disobedience and wondering came at a very high cost. And even when I'm on the right path, like when I'm actually doing the things that the Lord has asked me to do, I still am in need of a shepherd to lead me through the obstacles that life throws in my path. I have been taught more than I wanted to about the weariness and brokenness this world holds. I'm only 25. I know there's a lot more to learn about life from that, um, but I'm not exempt from experiencing it. I desperately need a shepherd who tenderly cares, restores, and guides me when other sins of brokenness throw me off course, let alone my own sins of brokenness. The beauty of Psalm 23 and the rest of the word is that there is a very good shepherd who can do just that. This psalm is full of promises about who our guide is and what his guidance is like. The Lord is my shepherd, David declares at the very start. It's not insignificant that David starts here, and it's where we should start in any conversation about God's guidance. Again, David was likely writing this psalm during his kingship. Perhaps it was during a time where he really needed to make a decision regarding the nation of Israel, or it was a fond remembrance of what the Lord had done for him already. Wherever we are, whatever guidance we need, whether we are in a sweet or a stressful season, our souls need this reminder as well. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, it is in his nature to lead and guide us. There's something like in me, I don't know, the Holy Spirit, maybe that's it, that stands up a little bit taller and feels a little bit more at ease when I think of this fact. Um, the God who has been present in all of eternity, who holds mountains in his hands, 
who knows all things and is in all things and possesses all things and does all things for my good is my shepherd. This is a God who has already proven himself throughout history as a shepherd, as someone who can and does and will lead people through anything. We can trust God's guidance because he has already proven himself as a guide. I traveled to Europe this summer between my junior and senior year of college to study abroad um, and went on some travel and did a bunch of different things that I could do as a college student. And I sat out all the tour guides and travel books and like Rick Steves Europe and all of those things um, so that I could get to my destination safely on time and without losing anything, which thankfully I didn't lose anything. I trusted those those tour guides, those travel books, those recommendations because of the reviews and expertise that they had. And we have a book full of reviews and centuries full of people's experience about how God has led his people in the past. He has a perfect track record. If he led the Israelites out of slavery and bondage, he will lead us to freedom. If he led them through the immovable Red Sea, he will lead us through whatever immovable object is in front of us. If he led them to the promised land, despite their disobedience, if we continue to turn to him, he will lead us out of our sin and into his promises. If he led David from the pasture to the throne room, he will lead us in every station of life. He led Peter at Pentecost. He led Paul to the Gentiles to spread the word of God. He gave the Holy Spirit to guide us day by day. Why would we think that he could not lead us where we are? He has not stopped being the good shepherd, and we have to remind ourselves of that lest we try and seek out our own way. My soul, though, is very quick to forget how God has led me in the past and slow to remember that he is faithful to lead me again. One of my mentors pointed out to me recently that with every plan-changing, anxiety-inducing, heartbreaking moment I've had this past year, I had this like knee-jerk reaction to try and figure it out my own way and come up with the solutions and next steps myself. I have somehow taught myself that when it comes to guidance and following Jesus, it is much better to strike out on my own trying to find my own way to the green pastures and still waters. And at some point, I've convinced myself that I've reached them, that I'm actually there in the pasture, that I'm there beside the still waters. But then I realize these streams are more like rapids, and the pastures wither way too quickly. It leaves me wondering what the next right step is, or if there are even streams and pastures of peace. God's guidance is never like that. David says, after noting who his shepherd is, I have all I need. Where my own guidance is lacking, the Lord's guidance is abundant. There is never a time when God is leading us that he gets to the end of the road or is out of wisdom or doesn't know how to direct us. He has abundant leadership because he sees, knows, and possesses all things. There are no limits to his nature, so why would there be limits to his leadership? What this doesn't mean is that you'll never have to wait on his guidance, that you won't hear no's when he is guiding you, or that it won't be hard, or that his direction will be easy. There's actually a lot of times when his guidance looks exactly like waiting, sounds exactly like a no, or is very hard. Sometimes guidance looks like making us wait where we are while our shepherd tests the footing of the path ahead of us. And sometimes our shepherd has to make us, as sheep, fit for the path he's about to lead us on. Don't make these times as, don't mistake these times as Jesus being unsure of what to do next. Thank him for being a shepherd that leads us into perfect guidance. David then says, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Our shepherd is also a good guide because he plans rest in the journey for us. The path that he has planned for us isn't constantly full of traveling and walking. Sometimes the pace of his leadership is actually no pace at all because we need to stop and be still. The state of our soul, I think, is actually a good measuring stick to determine whether we've been following God's guidance or our own. We need Jesus to lead us to rest because left to our own devices, the world and our souls have proven that it will go at a pace that tramples us into the ground out of weariness. And the path to the meadows and streams is well known to this shepherd. It is not well known to my soul. Um, my soul has actually proven to me time and time again that it only knows how to run around like crazy when I need rest. It does the exact opposite of everything that I need it to do. Therefore, I need a guide to get there. These very same spots are the places where our strength is renewed. Or, as some translations of the Bible put it, where our soul is restored. 
Again, the pace of this world is often a much different pace than that of our shepherd. The word translated renew here is the Hebrew word shub, and the more common biblical usage of this word is to return or turn back to something. So what do we return to when the Lord guides us? To return to what we were created for, to being under the guidance of the shepherd. While the rest of the world is seeking to be led by themselves, by each other, or by false gods, we as followers of Christ turn to the one we know has the path laid out for us and knows that path intimately. We return to the care and tenderness of a shepherd who has given his all to lead us. This is also the path of righteousness that brings honor to his name. The Lord, as shepherd, has a very intimate knowledge of our limitations, usually better than we know them ourselves. And yet he will still lead us to the places he has planned for us, no matter if we think we can make it to the destination or not. That's the point. People see his glory when we allow him to lead us. They can see the one who has no limitations in the one who has limits. Even righteousness is not something we can reach out on our own in our imperfection, but the perfect and righteous one, Jesus, leads us and teaches us how to walk the path of righteousness because he knows it well. He essentially created it as the only one completely righteous. And when, we, when others see us walking the path of righteousness, stumbling, but being led by the gracious shepherd, he gets glory. So you'll notice so far that I've really only talked about the fact that we are sheep and what the guidance of the good shepherd looks like. I've barely touched on what it is that we have to do as a sheep being led. And I did that intentionally. I wanted us to realize that if we look at the facts that tell us we're sheep and we are sheep that get lost and off track quite often, and we look at the facts about how absolutely perfect our shepherd's guidance is, the only option is for us to follow him. Okay, now obviously that isn't the only option. The world gives us a lot of choices. If we really wanted to, we continue. We could continue to be a sheep without a shepherd, but it's been proven that sheep without a shepherd don't last very long. Sheep are prey to multiple animals. They have no true defense system built in and couple that with their general lack of intelligence and you get a recipe for destruction pretty quickly. The other option is to find another shepherd, but abandon the good shepherd and you've chosen a path marked for destruction. And you certainly can't have two shepherds, for the Lord will not share your affection very long before he asks you to choose. So clearly, the best option is to follow him, right? So the definition of the word follow is to come after in sequence, order of time, etc. That means Jesus has to stay in front of us at all times. If we are in a valley of the shadow of death and Jesus' pace is at a walk, we walk. If there is a table in the middle of our enemies and Jesus sits, we sit. So we have to follow Jesus. We have to let him stay in front of us. But sometimes even that is hard to figure out how to do. At the end of the day, the best example of a shepherd is Jesus. But he's also the best example of how to be led. Jesus was fully man. So just like us, he needed guidance and he learned to submit and did submit to the guidance of his shepherd, the father. He followed him through it all, even to death. And following him to death allowed Jesus to see resurrection on the other side. I think God wants more sheep to follow him to death. I don't think very many of us will actually die for the sake of the gospel, but he still wants to lead us to death. Death of our pride, death of our desires, death of our plans, death of our sins, death of ourselves. And it's not because God is malicious or because he enjoys seeing pain or thinks it's fun to put snares in our paths. The Easter story we love and know so well proves to me that we only get resurrection life if there is death. I have had to let things die in my life, most of them being my own plans to earn a bunch of money doing Mary Kay or work for a really big newspaper or go to ESPN or even to serve in missions in South Dakota. But each time I've let those things die, and Jesus and I have kept taking new steps along the path he has me on, I come upon something that brings such joy, such excitement, such renewed passion for the Lord. I don't think the calling to serve would be so precious if I hadn't let countless dreams die on the road to that destination. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up, but I think that there are two questions the Lord wants us to ask ourselves. The first is, do you recognize God as a good shepherd? 
Maybe your soul needs to be reminded of how God has been faithful to lead you in the past. And as you look toward new unknowns, you need comfort that the shepherd is already ahead of you. Let him speak that over you. The other question is this. Will you follow him to death and let him lead you to resurrection life? Perhaps not all of us have something the Lord is asking us to let go of. But I would guess that there's a couple of us in this room who have been looking for guidance and coming up empty because we have yet to fully surrender to the Lord. God needs us to lay these things down before we can be led to the next step. Because if we are weighed down, we won't be able to climb his path as easily. So I want to take time and go ahead and pray for us over those couple of things um, before we finish up. Jesus, I thank you so much that you are such a good shepherd to us, Lord. You guide us and you lead us in perfection. God, you, you know the things that are coming ahead of us. You know what's on the path before we can even see it. And you are preparing us for the path you have us on. You are taking us through the right steps. And it's, Lord, the, the, this path of life is sometimes hard and it sometimes asks us to give up things. But Lord, your path is so good. Your path is worth being on. Your path is good for us, um, Lord. And so I, I pray that we have eyes this morning to see you as a shepherd in a new way, that you would give us eyes to see how your guidance is perfect, even when it requires us to lay things down, even when it requires us to let things die in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us the places where we are not letting um, things be surrendered to you, where we are holding on to things that need to die so that we can have resurrection. Um, Lord, speak to us. Lord, maybe may we allow our hearts to be examined by you as our shepherd because you know us so well and you can show us how to let those things die. Father God, I pray that you would show us this next week how we can rely on you as a shepherd throughout the day. Um, throughout our time with you, whether it's we're at work, whether we're just living life at home, um, whether we are on mission for you, Lord, show us how to follow you in the steps that you have for us. Lord, you are a good shepherd. Lord, we praise you for being who you are and that we get to follow you because this is a good life. This is a good path to be on as your sheep, as your children. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And it's in your name I pray all of these things. Amen.